Okay. Can I start? Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming here. Uh, my name is Ophir Arkin. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of a company called Insidex. And I'm here to uh, speak about uh, ways to bypass network access control solutions. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand. I'll be more than happy to answer the uh, question. Stop the presentation and answer the, the question. Um, the idea about the, this presentation is to first and foremost uh, introduce what's network access control. You'll see that this is not a simple question. Uh, talk about the different things that I think uh, should be part of network access control and then we'll talk about ways that we can um, utilize in order to bypass the current existing network access control solutions. Um, this is a bit about my background. I'm also the founder of the C Security Group. You can find them there. Some uh, information about my uh, previous uh, researches uh, and so forth. So, what is Network X Control? What, uh, what problem does it aim to solve? Um, what functions uh, do we want it to uh, support? Um, and what is it at all? Is it a compliance solution? Is it a security solution? Um, what, what actually is the problem that uh, network access control is aiming to solve? The problem is simple. Our enterprise LAN is a jungle. Everything with an RJ45, everything with some kind of a connectivity um, capability, wireless um, and so forth, is able to be connected to the network and gets an immediate network access. Think about your organization, think about um, other people's organization, and you'll find out that what you need to do is just a cord, and basically you get an IP address and you're on. So basically, as I said earlier, this is a jungle. The workstations, the servers, the printers, the wireless access points, the VoIP phones, the switches, the IP TV devices, the video devices, everything that can be connected is on our network. And the, uh, the problem is that we're not aware that those devices are actually on our network. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, if we need to uh, uh, defend our stability, integrity, regular operation, if we don't have the understanding that these devices are actually on our network, then all of those will be in jeopardy. Actually, the first company who basically identified this problem was uh, Cisco Systems back in 2003. Um, if you remember uh, the blaster worm, then uh, shortly after Cisco had announced an initiative that will allow them to uh, uh, check the compliance of a device when it is connected to the network, making sure that uh, it has the right patches, making sure that it has antivirus updates on and so forth. That was the first world initiative in order to actually enroll network access control. And basically from that point on it just evolved. There are other initiatives uh, like Microsoft uh, Network Access Protection, the trusted uh, computing groups, uh, uh, TNC and so forth. At the end of the day, there is no standardization around network access control. You can't go to uh, a certain website to download a nice PDF or a text document and that document is going to tell you what actually needs to be in a network access control solution. So first and foremost, we don't understand the definition and then we don't even understand what are the different components that such a system needs to hold. Uh, in such a situation, basically a lot of definition exists. And a lot, a lot of mayhem actually exists as well because if I can't define it, then everyone's definition is a winner. But if we try for a second to understand what network access control actually should provide, then first and foremost, um, we need to control network access. And as such, at least I believe, that this is a security solution before it is a compliance solution. So that actually means that uh, instead of uh, saying, okay, let's check the device that it has the proper uh, uh, patches, the proper antivirus uh, updates and so forth, we need first to make sure that it actually belongs to the organization and then basically we need to put the other end on top of that and make sure that it's actually compliant. 
Because I don't care if it's compliant or not if I don't understand that it exists or if it's uh, operating in a rogue manner on my network. So again, first and foremost, we need to understand if the device actually belongs to the network and it's ours, and then we put the compliance on top of that. At the end of the day, this is a risk mitigation solution because we need to lower the risks that our organization may have, not only from rogue devices, but in most cases from those, but also from non-compliant um, endpoints which might bring other, th other stuff to the network. So how do I define network access control? Um, a set of technologies and defined processes which uh, controls access to the uh, enterprise, network, uh, enterprise network and allows only authorized and compliant devices to access the network. This is slightly different than the, so, than the um, usual definition that you'll, uh, that you'll hear. Again, if you have questions or if I go too fast, just let me know and I'll answer your questions. So if we look at the different components that needs to be into uh, a network access control solution, then we can define basically six different components that are a must in my opinion. First, of, first and foremost, we need to detect the availability or the presence of a new element on the network. We need to understand that uh, um, a new element has, a has actually been attached to the network and that actually drives the network access control process. Without the understanding that there's a new element on the network, there's no ability whatsoever to actually start the process. <coughs> Validation is the process of checking the validity and the, um, the device basically for uh, authorization rights, meaning that I make sure that the device actually belongs to the organization. Validity actually holds also the ability to validate the user's identity. You will see that a lot of different solutions selects only to do user authentication and I'll show later why it's not such a good uh, idea to just do user authentication for network access control and why the uh, device authorization is also a must in this uh, area. Assessment is basically the ability to go and assess the compliance of a certain device to the network access policy of the organization. Usually this is only against Windows based devices. Someone can tell me why this is not such a good idea against other devices currently. Why, for example, Mac OS X or Linux are not put into assessment? What are, are you actually assessing there? That's, uh, that's also a problem. I mean, we look at Windows and we say, okay, we have patches, we have antivirus, we have some environmental uh, parameters that we look to have. On Linux and Mac OS X, this is, this is slightly different. Let's say that I have an antivirus installed on my Mac here. So okay, what is going to detect? The Windows uh, virus is nothing more than that. So strictly uh, from this point on, at, at this point, sorry, um, today, maybe in the future, there will be also assessment processes that are actually valid on other operating systems under the Windows. Enforcement and quarantine is a very important piece. Basically, the elements that are not are not compliant with the organization policy are put into a special holding place called the quarantine where they're waiting or they're being remediated um, and basically uh, a fix needs to be applied to them in order for them to actually be readmitted to the general population of the network. Um, enforcement usually uses the same mechanisms that the quarantine uses and we'll talk about that in a length because there are a lot of problems into how you put the device into quarantine and what it is actually capable of doing once in the quarantine. On the remediation side, this is the ability to fix the issue that um, had caused the device to get into the quarantine. Um, there is automated remediation for some things. Uh, basically, you can trigger the antivirus to uh, go and update itself. You can uh, put um, configuration parameters on the device and so forth. And last is provision, which basically means that Throughout the life cycle of the element on the network, you still need to assess that the profile of the device still matches the, those um, parameters you put into your assessment profile and that nothing had changed, so access is still being granted to the, um, to the element. If something changes, you need to stop this, uh, this access. So basically, these are the different, uh, uh, different uh, um, things that need to be put into a network access control solution. This was a, a very fast introduction into what network access control should have, um, what's the definition, and what are the capabilities. Questions? Okay. 
So what are the attack vectors? Basically, the nice thing about uh, this is that we can attack everything. Like with any other technology, we can take different pieces and we can try to, uh, to see where we can actually put an attack against. So first is the architecture. How this actually works. How the different ports interact. What are they sending each other? We'll see some examples for how we can uh, play with that as well. Technology. Each piece of the feature or each feature can be attacked. Um, for example, the element detection process, the device authorization, the assessment, the quarantine. I'll show examples on how you can actually bypass or actually can attack each of those um, features. The various components can be actually um, attacked as well. Uh, the client itself, the servers that are being used, and the infrastructure itself. So in that respect, you can attack them as well. So as you, as you may see, there's different things that we can do here. We'll go over uh, with this presentation over the definition, which plays a role, although this is not an attack, but it's something of importance to understand. We'll talk about element detection and we'll um, understand how we can actually put an element on the network without being detected. The validation stage will, sh will show some examples for that. Talk about the quarantine, talk about the enforcement and assessment, and we get to the definition. So basically, um, the problem, as I said earlier, is first, first is with the definition, how we can actually define what's network access control. Is this a posture validation only? Is this done against all devices, and is it a security solution or a compliance solution? And actually, I'm, I've set here an example with the uh, definition that the Trusted Network Connect of the uh, TNG is actually saying. As you can read on the highlighted red, security requirements for endpoints connecting to the corporate network, collecting endpoint configuration data, policy compliance. So this means that instead of saying, okay, we first uh, actually controlling the access to your network and then we're going to assess if those devices are actually compliant with uh, what you would like to, um, um, your elements to adhere to, we're saying, okay, this is only the compliance piece. And this is a very dangerous thing because if you don't define this solution as a security solution and make sure that your devices first and foremost belongs to you and there are no rogue devices and only then perform the compliance, what you're actually implying here that like patch management solutions, give me your um, you know, username and password with administrative rights, I'll connect to my domain controller, I'll get the list of uh, elements that log on to the uh, domain and I'll check the compliance against them. Sounds really bad, right? Why is this bad? Because at the end of the day, there are elements which do not log on to the domain, which there are elements which uh, log on to other domains and so forth. So this might illustrate the problem here because if we use the 80-20 rule in security, it simply will not work. So this is the example. As I said earlier, the, uh, the, one of the most important features about network access control is uh, element detection. Basically, um, the idea is that NUC is being triggered by element detection. If I detect a new element is being attached to the network, then the NUC process can start. But um, as we will see, most of the solutions today simply don't understand the contextual network information. They wait for something to happen in order for them to detect that there is actually a new device on the network. They don't have the detection capabilities that alert them in real time, at least most of them, that there is a new device, and therefore if there is no knowledge about the device, there is no control, no defense, because there is no network access control. So how, what are the different methods to do element detection? And here there is a vast ways, actually vast um, uh, op options to do this. Uh, from listening to traffic, listening to DHCP requests, listening to, broadca to broadcast traffic, uh, listening to traffic that goes through a certain monitoring point, um, or even uh, listening to traffic that goes through inline devices, integrating with the switch, like 802.1x SNMP traps, can someone tell me? Can tell someone tell me why integrating with the switch is a problem? Just off, off the top of your heads. Lunch wasn't that heavy. Okay, the idea here is that basically you rely on something you don't provide in order to have a certain feature enabled. So if you go to an organization, and I'm sure that some of you work for small organizations, 
10,000 people, 15,000 people. Think about all the infrastructure that is involved with uh, this type of organizations. So how can I actually tell who are all of my elements on the network and especially the switches? Now among those switches, usually you're not gonna buy um, the equipment from a single vendor. You're gonna buy from different vendors and along the time, you'll have different versions of the software of those switches. So for some switches, some of those capabilities you know, you'll be able to enable them out of the box. For other switches, you'll either need to throw the switch out or to basically upgrade the uh, switch. Think about 10,000 people, think about 15,000 people, think about 1,000, 2,000 switches that you need to play with. It doesn't fly at the end of the day. Um, there's another option to put the client-based software on top of the device, so whenever the client is connected to the network, that basically the client software will tell the server, hey, I'm here. That's, uh, that's another losing um, approach and we'll see why. Um, so basically, passive network detection. Um, one of my favorite topics, I actually um, have published um, a, a paper about that uh, in back in 2005, there's a lot of material there. The biggest problem here is that we cannot control or those solutions cannot control what they see on the wire. I cannot make you send email and I cannot make you open your browser and I cannot make you do something else in order to draw conclusions from your traffic about your device. Now the device can also be idle on the network. Printers usually don't send their traffic through routers. They don't. Um, switches, they'll have their own management, uh, management networks and you don't see them sending traffic through, this, the, um, um, through routers. And there are other devices at the end of the day that are being approached and are not approaching other systems. So basically, if I cannot control what I see and if I can, cannot control the pace of the discovery, it means that I cannot discover everything that is onto the network. So if I connect locally to that network, don't broadcast any traffic if the listener is at layer two, basically I will not be detected. And if the listener is at layer three, it's even worse because I can do whatever I want on the local subnet and nobody will know that I'm there. Um, this is a good example to illustrate, uh, to illustrate the problem. Um, usually there are two ways of doing this. Uh, first, there is a broadcast listener that is uh, usually a local software installed of one of the servers and listens to broadcast traffic only. And another option is to insert either an inline hardware or actually put an out of band uh, solution that is connected to the switch and gets passive traffic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the layer three, first and foremost, it's not real time because if something is connected to the network, we cannot make that something actually send the traffic through the router or through that uh, specific monitoring point and access to the local subnet will be given. Nothing can be done against it. Um, at layer two, we can do other tricks. Two examples. One of them is uh, with Cisco Clean Access. This is actually taken from the uh, uh, um, original presentation. The problem here is that the detection of the device is actually being done here at this stage. Now you can see that from the device to the, the, um, to the um, actual component here, the device may connect through wireless, the device can connect through many hopes, the device can do whatever he wants or she wants, well, it's actually the user, it's not the device. So if uh, the user wishes to access anything that is not controlled by this uh, server, it can, do, it can do that, no problem. There's nothing that actually blocks the device from doing so. Another example is again with, uh, with Cisco. And this is, um, again, a slide from their uh, slide deck. Here you can see that uh, the solution is actually being enrolled throughout the branches and throughout the data center. And, their, and the, um, the presentation basically says that you can basically defend only the data center and you don't need to do anything at the branches. Can someone tell me why this is not such a good idea? What at the end of the day goes down? Let's think blaster, what did go down? The access, not the core. Because blaster showed us that a simple worm with, uh, with ping capability basically can bring down the switches, the access switches. From experience I can tell you that 
a lot of companies had internet connectivity running. That was fine because the core switch survived, but all the access basically failed. So what we want to avoid is we want to avoid a situation in which in a certain branch, which may have an important data or still may have a lot of people, someone will connect, will not be identified, and would be able to do whatever he, she wants, and still infect the, infect the elements, steal data, do what I, whatever. So if I concentrate my defense only at the data center, then I miss all the branches, and not always the branches needs to go through the headquarters for internet access. So in that respect, I don't control anything rather than uh, saying that I control just the stuff that goes through the data center. Is this uh, understood? Another interesting example is all with the broadcast listeners. The idea of a broadcast listener is that whatever we send broadcast, it will be heard by the broadcast listener. The problem here is that we can, we can actually uh, change that quite easily. Instead of broadcasting the traffic with, for example, the ARP uh, example here, I can send unicast ARP requests and not broadcast ARP requests. Everybody that will receive that will be more than happy to reply to those uh, requests and will send me the, uh, the replies. So in that way, I can actually communicate with the router without any problem, receive the, uh, the router's uh, MAC address, and surf to the internet with no problem at all. So the broadcast listener would not even understand that my device is onto the network and would not be able to defend the network against what I'll do. Well, this is just a simple, uh, simple example for the broadcast uh, listener, but we will see later on an example for the broadcast listener plus an inline device in um, a combo, and we'll see how we can bypass them as well. Other examples, um, DCP. Um, um, on DCP, usually they put uh, the solution put a DCP relay server in s before, uh, basically in front of the uh, original D DTP server. That DTP server actually gets the DTP requests, hands um, non-routable IP addresses, and after the NAC process, it basically um, allow the um, request to get to the original DTP server, and there's a renewal of the IP address. This is another bad example of element detection because if I configure my machine with a static IP address, nobody knows I'm there. SNMP traps, uh, there's a trend on, especially on Cisco gear, to tor turn on a trap which basically says that um, um, a new element uh, is connected due to the fact that a new MAC address is registered on a certain port. This only works if your um, switch actually has this capability in its software. The problem here, as I mentioned earlier, is with the switches. Where are they in the first place? And the second thing here is that um, if you don't know your infrastructure, then you have a real problem, uh, a real problem of doing this. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say about this, excuse me, is basically that the fact that the SNMP trap is being sent, but the time to process the SNMP trap is also a problem. Because usually you'll have a gap that for, uh, for some equipment will go between 30 seconds to even two minutes before the information about the SNMP trap will actually be processed by the management a management um, um, server of that particular solution. So the gap here is between 30 seconds to two minutes that that element can, uh, can do whatever, uh, whatever he wants on the network. How, uh, how fast uh, did it take to send the SQL worm? How many packets did the SQL worm had to send? Someone knows? Only one packet. So 60, 30 seconds to 120 seconds, that's a no-go, because we need to block the access as soon as the device enters the network, rather than to wait for something to trigger that and allow it a window of opportunity to do whatever it wants on the network. Um, on the client software, again, uh, client-based software that cannot be installed in certain operating systems, and again, you're vulnerable here. Um, other things that will not go into how you defend from that enabled devices, uh, how you de detect NAC, uh, virtualization makes a huge problem here. Because basically if I uh, have, a, have a device with uh, VMware, with Xen, with Parallels, with whatever, and I launch it in a uh, NAT mode rather than in a bridge mode, usually nobody will detect the presence of that, uh, that operating system. Questions? Yes. Uh, just one question. The HCP, uh, 
Um, yeah. There are devices with remote control that usually allow traffic through if you have not used Mm-hmm. You refer to basically DHCP protection that some switches may have. The problem there is that on paper it looks very nice. The problem is that if you don't control each and every switch and you filter on each and every switch, that doesn't work. Because it's only, it's only good, it, it will fail if you bring a switch that is not configured that way. And if you don't control your entire environment, then the access list that you have to introduce on each and every switch basically will not do that work because your traffic will still be a, uh, able to be sent. Um, another issue with that is that as, as, as your organization's internal network goes bigger, your ability to actually control the switches or control your elements is ba basically lowered. So in that respect, if you want to make sure that all of the configuration actually <clears throat> is on the end, uh, is where it needs to be, you need to know the, your entire infrastructure in order to do so. But that's a valid difference, actually. Validation is the process of uh, authorizing devices uh, to uh, operate on the LAN um, by identifying their identity um, of the devices and of the users. The idea here is that we wish to combat rock devices. This is again tied with the um, element detection features. And at the end of the day, this shows us why we must immediately block any rogue element that tries to uh, connect to our network. The problem here is again, I mentioned that earlier, not all of the, uh, not all of the uh, NAC solutions will actually authorize devices. Actually, most of them will not. Um, and basically, since they lack the ability to understand the uh, contextual network information, the time gap that a certain element will have to do whatever he wants on the uh, network, or the user will have, is, is quite substantial. Um, on the other hand, if uh, you look at those solutions that mandates only user authentication, then there's a problem here as well. Because at the end of the day, what we um, actually can do is we can bring any type of hardware we would like, use a username and password that is valid to the NAC solution and gain access to the network with the rogue device. So technically speaking, this is easier stealing a user's identity or for example, uh, bringing my laptop from home, multiple connect several devices and do whatever I want on the network because I have a username and password that is valid to, uh, to the network access control solution. Another example, same slide. Um, you can read what is uh, in the uh, middle. Network access is blocked until end user, the end user uh, provides login information. There's no relation whatsoever to the endpoint here. Basically, you bring your device, you browse, you're presented with a, uh, with a nice captive portal telling you download this agent. You download the agent, you put your username and password, off you go, you're okay. No problem. So in my opinion, time between the device and the user is extremely important. Um, and it basically creates a binding which is needed for strong authentication, authorization, and of course for auditing. And an identity is something that we all are looking to have uh, stronger and stronger in our organizations. Um, another quite uh, interesting example, it with uh, DTP replacement servers. Basically, I call this uh, DTP in a box. You get a DTP replacement server. Uh, the way this works is you request an IP address. You get a non-routable IP address. You are redirected to some kind of a, an authentication portal. The authentication portal requires your username and password. You provide your username and password. Um, the um, information is being checked against uh, a user data storage. And that user data storage basically verifies or not your authenticity of the user. And there might be other checks to, uh, to follow. And at the end of the process, if the element is compliant, then uh, the DTP server provides a real IP address to the device. What's the problem here? Old attack. I just uh, installed my Linux machine, configure, configure DTP server, and this is a race. If my DTP server answers first, the user will use my DTP server. And I build my own captive portal the same as the captive portal for the organization. And I provide uh, as well as uh, user data storage. And basically I steal all the usernames and passwords. 
So technically speaking, this is um, you know an attack from the old days that I can use here. And why is this uh, even much more problematic? Because with the username and passwords, I can do whatever I want on the domain. I can access whatever data I want, and I can do whatever I want. So this is why this, for example, is a bad idea to use these type of solutions. Um, we'll talk about 802 1x later. Um, questions? Okay. Okay, so basically assessment, we talked about what it is. The first uh, thing that we want to do with assessment is first of all, identify and classify the underlying operating system that the device has. Why? Because we need to decide if we want to put this device through assessment or not. And there are various ways to actually classify a device. Uh, Client-based software, active OS detection, passive OS detection, JavaScript, captive portals, and some more stuff. Like anything in life, uh, not everything is actually created equal. Um, this is uh, an example from uh, the Cisco NAC appliance agent. Um, the way that the agent actually um, used the, um, uh, his ability to sniff traffic on the network was that it was looking into the user agent string, and if it didn't uh, unveil that this uh, element is Windows, it basically let the device go. Uh, we all know that this is uh, absolutely no-no, and uh, of course there was a patch for this, um, and also um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the you just read that; it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, basically, what Cisco said is that uh, you can also use another feature in the product, which called Nessa Scan that you can remotely scan the element and get its operating system. Okay, wait two slides and see why this is not gonna work. The assessment methods themselves, as I said, client-based, client-less, dissolving agent and remote vulnerability scans. If I put an agent, of course, it's great from the advantage points. Wealth of information, real-time protection. The problem is, um, the problem is not even where to install the client. Of course this is a problem, but the biggest problem is that this is a client among many other clients. And um, I know from experience that uh, when you come to, a, come to a company, and I have a lot of friends who are um, um, in the management systems business, and they say, okay, uh, we just need to install this client on your desktop. Here's the door, thank you very much. It was interesting, but we're not interested. There's no room for another client on the desktop, period. There's so many clients, there's so many super clients, and basically IT and help desk and operation will not let you install another client on the desktop. It's not just the management overhead, it's not uh, um, the, even the amount that it takes to implement. Um, it's the fact that people just don't like agents anymore and they don't want to use agents anymore. On the other hand, um, the other question is, where do I install the agent, which is another important question, because we don't know where to install the agent because we don't know all of the targets. So it again, the chicken and the egg problem, catch 22 or the 80-20 rule, you can call it whatever, but in the end of the day, this is gonna fail. Uh, security issues, um, the one first rule that every, every consultant learns is that no one can actually uh, uh, trust Client-side security. There's no such, a thi uh, such thing as client-side security. And there are, again, some examples here. I'm sorry that this is all Cisco, but it's all public and, and showed. So first is the, the agent itself. And another something which is extremely, uh, extremely important is the communication between the NAC agent and the server itself. Because if you're able to falsify the communication between the agent and the server, you basically control whatever. And there was a nice presentation, I think uh, a year ago, uh, called NAC Attack, which basically um, reverse engineered the protocol. without any uh, user authentication, and on those cases it was, uh, <coughs> possible, possible, okay. 
um, it was possible to actually um, bypass the NAC framework because user um, authentication was not enabled. So the official response from Cisco was, well, you, we do have the ability to do authentication, and if you do authentication, your attack doesn't work. But that's, you know, not the case. Um, so we will see more NAC, uh, NAC agents or uh, being attacked in the future. It's like um, antivirus agents um, that are being targeted today. Because at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, um, uh, we know that there are some viruses and worms that um, tells you, yes, the antivirus is operating, but <laughs> yeah, right, it's just the icon. <laughs> we can do animation as well. Um, so that actually brings us to the all-in-one agent. There's a, um, <laughs> okay. So there's uh, also a trend that uh, people say, or some, some companies um, uh, say, okay, let's uh, install a super agent and we'll put antivirus on this power personal firewall, anti spam net, and in the future, whatever you would like, just uh, you know, $29.95. And the problem is that everything is located in one place. So if I will be in, uh, able to make this fail, basically all of your defenses are useless. So, um, this is actually a very interesting um, uh, trend was in the past to, you know, the firewall, the VPN, you know, traditionally were put into a single box. Still, you know, Checkpoint put them on a, on a single box. Cisco put them on, you know, different boxes. But who cares? It works, right? We, we don't mind. It works. Everybody does whatever it needs on that one. But the um, super consolidation trend of the two years ago, let's put everything on the same box. It puts everything on, on that. At the end of the day, it's not going to fly because um, you need to use especially large organizations uses different products for different things and from different vendors. So your email is getting processed by three, four different vendors. Your other uh, corporate stuff being uh, filtered by three, four different th things at a whole. So you can't really put everything on the same boxes anymore. Okay, agentless. Uh, that's a great approach. No, nothing to install, fast deployment, uh, custom checks on the fly because you only need to change it on the service side. You know, on the other end, you need the willingness of the other party to say, okay, let's work together. I'm willing to give you the access. And that's actually a problem because um, not all of the devices uh, will give you that uh, ability to access them. Um, and again, the communication between the solution and the device uh, makes an excellent attack vector as well. Um, dissolving agent, this is, uh, this is my, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, everybody's saying, oh yeah, we have this ActiveX or JavaScript or you know, Java component that does this and does that. Well, first and foremost, two big problems. Local administration rights or power user rights. Okay, we are IT people and most of the people get administration access to their machines, but there are some people which will never assign administration, administrator access to their boxes. And the other one is that if I want my browser, especially with uh, Vista or uh, the new um, uh, versions of the service packs and such, I need to lower the security level of my browser to the level which I call Mika Sasuka. So I basically just, I open everything that you can do to me in order to assess my security. So what did I do? I just killed my security on my browser, got you to um, you know, assess what I have, and now my browser security is so low that you know, the, the whatever you do to me, I'm just my client breaks. So this doesn't work at all. And my favorite one is the remote vulnerability scans. Okay, how many of you don't use personal firewall? Thank you, I proved my point. We can continue. Um, also, there are some quite interesting stuff here. What are we actually checking? Okay, so if, uh, if I'm um, checking service spec, if I'm checking uh, signature files, actually it's hard to signature files, depends on the vendor. But if I check the service packs, hotfixes, and stuff like that, go to your registry, create the entry. Great, that's it, works. Um, why is this so easy? Because Microsoft does not provide any kind of proof that something has actually been installed. They're not gonna disclose this information. So at the end of the day, you come and say, oh, I want to know that patch number this and this was actually installed in your machine. We're not gonna tell you exactly what we changed with the DLLs, what we're actually done, so 
That's what we're le being left with. So this is one of the things. The other thing, as I said again, is the communication channel between the uh, uh, NAC agent and the server. And here there is um, actually some cool stuff that you can do. Um, you can do replay attacks, and you can actually do a sniff and spoof. So if you're able to understand what is being sent, and if the protocol is not that good, you can actually understand what is being sent between the NAC agent and the server, understand what is actually being um, checked, falsify that, and be happy. Questions until this point? Before I get to another interesting topic. OK. So basically, exceptions. If I cannot do something in the process, uh, some NAC solutions came and said, oh, yeah, I'll do an exception. I'll give you, you know, free pass. It's like in Disneyland. You go and they hand you the free pass and say, OK, come back in two, and you just go off the uh, thing, and that's it. The problem is that if we use a technology, a technology like 802.1x, we'll have devices that we, need, uh, that we need them to operate in our environment like our AS400 and the printers and the VoIP devices uh, that can't really run anything or does not comply with 802.1x. So what do you do? Um, you simply go and say, um, hosts that cannot run the whatever can be granted access to the network using manually configured exceptions by MAC or IP address. Hmm. And now if you're a VoIP device, even better, just send me the CDP message and I'll give you access. Great. And even better, if we can't handle you, just give us your Mac and you'll be great. Okay. So this is great, but I don't know nothing about the device. Because those solutions basically don't tell me what's the operating system for the device, where it is actually connected, what's the type of the element. Um, is this the same parameters that we observed before, or my printer now turned into uh, Windows Vista or Linux? So what we do is we go to the printer. All the printers now has this uh, capability. Even at home, my uh, HP All-in-One, you can go and play, and you print all the configuration. You know, wasting your ink. Thank you, HP. And uh, basically, it writes, "Oh, this is the MAC address. This is the configuration. This is everything." You take the printer, take it offline. You put your device in, thank you, spoof the MAC address, and you get, get the access of the printer. OK, just a printer, right? Um, actually, um, when I did this presentation uh, back in the US a year ago, um, there's someone who came to me and said, why not putting the printer in their own subnet? It's a good idea. It's not a bad idea. But the problem is that you need to do all of your printers across the routers. That's not a good idea. Just uh, do, uh, um, do a test and see how much traffic is actually consumed by printing. Not, uh, not that uh, uh, nice idea, although putting the printers in the same subnet is not a bad idea at all. So this is the exceptions. Um, 802 x is the biggest problem with the exceptions because this is a username password based protocol, nothing more than that. You need the software agents to do the extras. Or you need a software agent in order to do the username and password stuff. Um, it's difficult to manage. Not everything is, is uh, actually supporting 802.1x from the client side and from the networking side. There's a huge cost for this. How many know how many implementations worldwide 802.1x is doing on the LAN side? <coughs> Nearly nothing. Because it's really hard actually to enroll 802.1x into the wire side. On the wireless side, great. On the wire side, it's not going to fly. Don't go into there. Waste of money. Um, so basically, after you invested your money at 802.1x on the wire side, you now need to understand, you want to enable that. So you need to profile off your devices that actually operates on the network. And you need to decide who cannot do 802.1x. And surprise, surprise, 30, 40% of your network cannot do 802.1x. OK, we just invested a lot of money. We just invested a lot of uh, manpower into uh, just enrolling this. We're OK. And you see the problem. OK, questions? I'm going to steal five minutes from, the, from your coffee or from whatever. Um, I'll just go through quarantine fast. It's actually a, a, nice, um, a nice idea. So basically, um, quarantine is the place. And when I mean the place, it is the place. Why? Because all of the bad boys, bad girls for you know, being politically correct here, being put into the quarantine. Um, basically, I didn't comply with something. I need to remedy it, the user, and I'm being put in a temporary holding place. 
The access is granted only to the remediation server. But one thing that we need to understand, the soft targets of the entire organization are now being put into one place, into the quarantine. Several uh, ways to do quarantine. Using access lists, uh, using a dedicated subnet, a dedicated VLAN, private VLANs, per switchboard, manipulating ARP cache entries, and some others. Um, at the end of the day, one of my favorites one is the uh, public, uh, public quarantine. The public quarantine basically means that it allows communication between all of the quarantine devices. So this is what I, I call the self-infecting VLAN. <laughs> I'll put all of my devices into one place. I'll get into that, uh, that uh, quarantine holding place. And my aim is to infect you all. Easy, right? Because those are the self-targets. I have access. So what are we doing here? Also, if you would like to attack the self-targets, not the virus or worm, if you are a hacker or someone with malicious intents and you want to try to abuse something which is a zero day and you know that you can abuse it, this is the place for you to be. Because then you can inject whatever you want into that device, say, oh, antivirus is working all in one. Ah, great, antivirus is working as well. Put whatever you want on the device and control the device, even if the device passed, uh, passed whatever checks your NAC, uh, NAC may have. Um, other, other things about the uh, quarantine VLAN. Um, the idea of dynamically assigning uh, uh, VLAN IDs to the port. If you don't know, the way this works is there's a new element which automatically is being assigned to the quarantine VLAN. There are checks that are being done and only then it's being uh, basically uh, taken out of the quarantine VLAN. The problem here is that if you're in a really controlled environment like finance institutes, bank, whatever, um, your change control people, your audit people really like you because you'll never have the ability to actually deploy this because there's no way in whatsoever that the uh, VLAN um, IDs are going to change for, for the ports dynamically. Nothing is not going to happen. Um, also, uh, if you remember, I talked about relying on the infrastructure to provide with a capability which is basic for network access control. This is a good example. If I don't have the switches that allows me to do this, I can't provide with it. So what, I'm going to buy a solution from an ACK vendor as, and then I need to go to an uh, infrastructure vendor and buy the switches and I need to see that they both play in the same area? That's not going to fly because the amount of, of money that you will need to invest into making your infrastructure actually capable of working with this is a lot of money as well as the fact that this is um, only a per port per device policy. Hubs. You all know them, unmanaged switch. Uh, in the US, you go to CompUSA for 30 bucks, you get a five port, 10, 100, 1000 dealing switch. Five port, really cool. We have like trillions of those at work. Everyone wants one. So whenever I go to the US, hey, bring me one, bring me one, okay. But at your, at your place of work, you'll find non-managed uh, switches. The switches that you bought five, six, seven, eight years ago and now been pushed to the access, sometimes it happens because not all of us can buy all the switches altogether and they're unmanaged. So they act as hubs and then for, therefore you can't do, you do this on, against them. Um, other than that, one last thing I would like to mention is the read-write access you need to the switches in order to do those changes. And again, go to your networking people, they'll be more than happy to provide you with that. Um, the private quarantine is the solution, in my opinion, for that. Basically, putting the element into a private uh, silo that prevents, uh, prevents others from communicating with it and prevents his communication with the quarantine, other quarantined elements. This can, do, this can be actually being uh, done in private VLANs, layer two based methods, and other things. A good example why layer three based quarantine is bad um, inline hardware. It doesn't uh, actually do a lot if uh, it just blocks the access to other parts of the network. Uh, basically, I'm not allowed, this is allowed. I can uh, try to um, uh, attack this device and use it as an access proxy to other parts of the network. Uh, there are other ways to uh, play with these attacks. Also, when is the quarantine enabled? Um, only when an element should be assessed. After the assessment, assessment or immediately, and the, the answer is immediately because we don't know the device. We don't know what this device holds. We don't know what's running on the device and we don't know if the user is authenticated, device is authorized, and it's actually happening here. So if you are assessing a network access control solution, 
then look for this. The device needs to be quarantined immediately, so the risks that may be um, put by this device to the organization will be minimized. Um, on the enforcement side, basically, um, I'm just going to go through this fast. Uh, there are various ways to do enforcement, layer three, layer two, at the switch level. Um, usually at the switch level, it's only per port per device. Uh, you can see the uh, various uh, ways to do this here. Um, the one example I, w I wanted to speak about was the broadcast listener and inline device combo. There's actually a solution that uses that. So basically you have a broadcast listener on the local network and an inline device that uh, works as an IPS on layer three. Um, the problem is that you need to completely re-architecture a network. Uh, the inline devices are a point of failure. Uh, if you want to have redundancy, 2x the, 2x the uh, cost. And again, you don't get to identify the device. So the device, not only that the device is not identified, um, that you can actually bypass the local uh, listener, uh, this particular solution do not even provide with device authorization and do not provide with user authentication. So simply put, if you just manipulate your app request and don't broadcast anything to the network, you're happy to, uh, to basically connect to the network because the inline device acts, acts as an IPS only. It's not actually integrated with the, uh, with the broadcast listener. So it doesn't actually block access from those IP addresses it sees at layer three that weren't actually authorized by the local broadcast listener. Um, Resources, questions, still just two minutes late. Questions? <coughs> Once, twice. Okay, so uh, thank you all for having me and enjoy the conference. <laughs>